about the way that communities come together to make sense of things, uh, to find the meaning within the, uh, within the system, within the conversation, and to do something with it. What does that process actually look like? You know, what is co-creation actually about? Now, this is one of um, a number of webinars. Let me just do this. So we're in webinar number nine of a series of 12. So I feel like we're making good progress through the work around social leadership. The previous eight webinars are all up on YouTube. So uh, if I don't scare you off today, do by all means jump back in to uh, explore uh, social leadership up to this point. Starts by looking at the foundations and the context and then building uh, our capability within it. And this is part of a wider exploration of the social age and you know what is the social age well it's the world that we live in today it's our, our new reality often we feel it as a tension between formal systems owned by organizations and social systems which are communities of individuals of people and the way that those two come together so let's sort of start by uh, getting into oh sorry i had one more slide here to show you the context so this is where how we got up to this point which is running through our uh, foundations and the need and then through the different aspects of the model but i want to get us right into uh, straight away the social leadership journey and to think about what is co-creation so um i started with uh, as i was just working on this this morning uh, i i captured these three things and the first one's probably almost the most important. Um, and I put co-creation co as a mindset whereby we hear the views of others and help to make them stronger. And what I'm trying to tie into here is a notion uh, of the humility of social leaders, a recognition that the role of leaders isn't to come with the answers. The role of leaders may be to hold open a space whereby a community itself can come up with answers. So in that concept, in that context, we, we start with mindset, really. We start with that mindset of recognition that we don't have the answers, but crucially, that we start by listening to others. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with what other people say, but we do have to engage with respect uh, and indeed engage in our differences with respect. And that's a notion that we'll come back to uh, later. Um, a, a core part of social learning communities and co-creation is that we're not necessarily looking for consensus. We may be seeking to understand our differences even better. And that ties into the notion of a socially dynamic organization because a socially dynamic organization will find its strength through the diversity of opinions that are held within it. So this is why it's a, a dynamic tension in some ways. We need diverse opinions and ideas but we also need the ability to pull together and do something with it. So a socially dynamic organization doesn't just think about stuff, it gets stuff done. But before it jumps into doing stuff, it has the time and the space and the capacity to explore, to co-create. That's really the, the balance that we're trying to hold. How do we remain reflective, but also able to take action? So the second point here really is about you can only have co-creation within high functioning communities. And that's quite an important point because I quite often find organizations talk about co-creation as if they're ordering a, a plate of pasta. You know, they say, well, we're going to do this and we'll run a workshop and we're doing the project and then we're going to co-create the solution. Um, but co-creation isn't like driving. You can't just sort of get in and do it. it it's an emergent feature of a high functioning system, uh, a finely tuned optimized system really. Uh, and if I were to explain what I mean by that, is that um, a high functioning community will have strong bonds of trust, for example. People will understand consequence and how it's applied. They will understand how they are each helping each other to be successful. You can't kind of go in and demand co-creation any more than you can go in and demand trust or demand love. You know, none of those things work. Uh, hence why I, I usually say it's this emergent feature. And if we think about, you know, what actually is co-creation, if you like, well, it, it speaks to the new nature of knowledge itself. Knowledge in the social age is dynamic, 
adaptive and evolutionary. It's, not, it's no longer codified and captured and fossilized and there forever. It's something which evolves over time through the input of every individual. So in that context, co-creation is a dynamic, adaptive and evolutionary process. We come together, we find the meaning in the moment, we do something with it, because remember, we've got that action focus, but then we revisit it, we come back, we talk about what we learned, we talk about what went right, what went wrong. And again, you can see perhaps how that relates to high functioning communities, because only within a high functioning community will people willingly share that sort of notion of, of what's gone right, what's gone wrong. So let's um, think about it. Now, the, the, the rest of this session, really, I'm going to take us on a bit of a journey through some of the material from um, the, my newest book, which was around social leadership, um, my first hundred days. And I, I'm doing that because it, it, it lets me um, test things out. Uh, I think I, I, I briefly went through the slide at the start saying this is a, a working out loud kind of session. So some of the, the slides um, that I'm showing here are the first time I've used these anywhere. So uh, you'll forgive me perhaps if I'm uh, still evolving the narrative around them. But this piece around co-creation is thinking about factors which impinge upon community. So what is the impetus to be engaged in a community to co-create? I've already said you can't demand it. So what impetus will encourage people to join that community and to, to take part in the activity? Um, I want to think about the incentive, you know, not financial incentive. If you actually ask people, uh, financial incentive usually comes around third in the list of things they say they want. You say, come together to help solve something. They don't say, I want to be paid for it. Typically, they say things like, I would like to help you be successful. That's, that's often number one or two. Uh, the other thing they say is, I'd like a chance to share my knowledge. You know, people often want to be heard. But again, these are uh, nuanced things. So if we're in an organization that demands people to co-create, then they may be less likely or willing to want to share their knowledge openly and freely. We have to get the conditions right, the conditions for community. So I've, I've kind of highlighted community at the bottom here because um, you remember on the, the previous slide, I talked about this high functioning community. So communities are the entity within which co-creation takes place. So within the community is you and me as individuals and then everybody else around us. Our impetus to be in that community will be driven by a combination of factors, but most of them are elective. You know, they, we choose to be within co-creative communities. In fact, this really speaks to, if you'll forgive me a minor detour, this speaks to the difference between a group and a community. So you can put people together in a collection, but that doesn't make a community, it just makes a group of people. A community will be something far stronger than that. It will share values, it will share purpose, it will share intent, it will have higher trust. Um, it's really uh, quite a different thing and it takes time to build community. In fact, the reason why I was running right to the edge of my deadline to be here today. I was talking to a client around um, what, uh, what they can do with communities. And they said, well, how long does it take to build a community? And that's a difficult question. It's kind of how long is a, a piece of string? Well, you know, in some cases, communities form very fast. But when I'm looking at it in a social learning context, I normally reckon you need about four weeks of activity to allow people to, to find um, their space and a, a pace within it. Now, I'm just quickly gonna pause because I'm trying to bring up the, um, the chat uh, because uh, if I bring that up, then if anybody asks any questions as we go along, I'll be able to uh, respond to them. But now I've got that up, I'll kick back in here. There we go. So um, let's move on and, and, and think about this notion uh, here of investing in co-creation and I, I really kind of um, sketched this out because I quite like the language and notion of investment because it's a conscious choice you remember on the last slide I was saying you know what's the impetus it, it's a conscious choice just being within a community doesn't mean you're necessarily part of the co-creative process 
there's an investment to be made. In fact, I guess to some extent we could say a co-investment because the organization has to invest in us and we have to invest in the community. And what is it that we're investing? Well, that's quite an interesting question. We're investing our energy and our effort. That's probably quite obvious. We're also investing our reputation to an extent. So by being within a community and being willing to take part in co-creative conversations, we are putting ourselves on the line. We're exposing ourselves to risk. You know, we might say something stupid. I might say something stupid today. You never know. It's a, you know, it's a fair bet that over the course of an hour, I'll, I'll say something and stumble over it. And, and th these are the risks. Co-creation is inherently about risk. Um, you might remember I said earlier that it's not about consensus. It's not about a right answer. It's about exposing ourselves to a range of right answers. That's why it starts with this mindset, almost a mindset of uncertainty or pragmatism, a willingness to accept everything that comes with it. So the investment from the individual can be about that, their time, their energy, their effort. It may also be things like their knowledge or their specific skills and capability. So, you know, I may, I may be part of a co-creative conversation and offer to take a storyteller role to help to sketch up or draw what we're talking about. Similarly, I may rely on other people to do that kind of thing. It's very much a, a, almost a barter economy, a high functioning community will be able to draw upon these, these diverse skills and ideas and be stronger as a result of all of those um, different inputs. So I thought I'd share here um, an earlier piece of work. You might even be able to notice it's slightly more pixelated because I, I drew it on an earlier version of the iPad. Um, but this is uh, from a, a social learning model uh, that I use. And it, it, it's looking at engagement and permission. And the reason um, I brought it up was because it just, it just outlines some of the other reasons why people are willing to invest in co-creation. This has come out of interviews with um, uh, quite a large population of people across uh, multiple sectors. So um, I think from memory, this was around 240 people I interviewed in, in this. Um, people talk about companionship. Uh, it's quite a key part of community, especially in disrupted organizations. They find a certain companionship from being in this democratized space where they can be part of the solution finding. But again, you can imagine that that companionship only comes if the community has trust and a sense of well-being at heart. Um, generosity, I've always sort of already mentioned this, people are generally generous with their time if we create an environment where they're able to be. Um, but competitiveness is another thing. Um, and I remember the results were quite skewed in this. In some of the more science and engineering companies, they showed a higher propensity to competitiveness. Now, maybe the sample size wasn't quite large enough to, to uh, generalize out of it, but you can um, encourage engagement in co-creation by making it somewhat competitive. That may tie in with, um, uh, with incentives as well, actually, and, and reward. Excuse me, I'm just jiggling my screen slightly so that I can uh, still see all the different parts that I need to see. There we are. Um, curiosity uh, was another very interesting uh, aspect of, of, of co-creation. So um, a sense of shared exploration and questing is nice. Uh, th this is especially true in organizations that are, are held deeply compliant or sort of held in place and have a very low permission to explore. Sometimes by creating co-creative spaces, people can claim or be given a high permission to explore and to be curious. Now, curiosity is quite an interesting uh, feature of learning. Uh, it's something that we do when we're young. Uh, very often, I was with a friend over the weekend who has their, um, their uh, four-month-old uh, toddler running around on the floor, just tasting everything, you know, picking things up, touching and feeling. Curiosity is a kind of a native uh, part of what we do. And we, we engineer it out of ourselves as we become more civilized and mature and experience more consequence. So in organizations, 
we're often not allowed to go around touching and licking everything. We're, we're, we're held in place by consequence. So um, creating space for co-creation can help to liberate that uh, curiosity. Um, voyeurism is a slightly odd one. Um, but nonetheless came up as a reason for engagement. The kind of people wanting to see what's happening, what's going to happen next. So they're not necessarily actively, uh, continuously engaging in the co-creative process, but wanting to see what's emerging out of it. Um, it is interesting, there was some, some research from the BBC uh, a few years ago that showed the number of people um, who are voyeuristic within communities is dropping. In the early days of the internet, of the internet and social um, collaboration, there tended to be a high number of observers and a small number of engaged individuals. But gradually, through social media primarily, we've learned to be highly engaged. So, um, Daniel, yes, let me uh, come back to a point there. A good, a good point, something that I failed to do. The CEDA model is um, a model that I was working on around two years ago. And it looks at um, uh, the health of a social learning community. And it does so by looking at um, an inner layer of uh, features. Uh, so um, things that we want. So um, we want uh, curation. So the C stands for curation. Will we get people to bring content into the community? E is for engagement. Uh, D is for uh, debate. Not, um, uh, not uh, having arguments, but, but um, debating things. And A is for action, taking action out of it. So in a, in a healthy community, people will curate content into it. They'll engage around that content and the co-creative process. They'll debate and have discussion about it, but then they'll take action as a result of it. So the, the inner circle, and I'm sorry that off the top of my head, I can't bring up the um the whole model but the outer ring uh, and here you can see a permission are confounding or enabling factors so the um the uh, oh thanks sam has actually shared the article there so um uh, curation can be either enabled or inhibited by technology uh, engagement can be enabled or inhibited by permission uh, and permission is quite interesting because if we don't grant it it can be claimed um, de uh, debate can be um, really hindered or enabled by consequence um, and application, I mu must admit off the top of my head, I can't remember the confounding factor. But if you follow the link uh, from uh, that Sam's posted uh, there, you'll be able to look into it. And if you have any questions around that, do um, drop me a, a note. I'll be happy to share the, the, the work behind it with you. So yeah, sorry for, for uh, I've slightly distracted myself there uh, with that, but it, it, it came to mind this morning as I was um, working on it. One uh, side piece there, if you are interested in that, I wrote a piece recently called Conditions for Community. And it looks at, I think, 16 different aspects that we can consider when we're looking to build communities. That's a recent piece on the blog. If you just search for conditions for community, you'll, you'll find it. So let's just think about another aspect of co-creation. And this is uh, quite a, a interesting, quite an important one. It, it, it's about who owns the conversation. And this is uh, really a, a feature of um, the old and the new world. So organizations uh, often take a view that if you do it at work, it belongs to us. But in social communities, we might have a slightly different view that, you know, if we have a debate and a discussion now, and we come up with a new idea. Well, whose idea is that? You know, it's not my idea, but it's not your idea. It's kind of our idea. So um, who owns the conversation is important. So again, organizations can give us technology, but technology isn't the conversation because we can claim a permission. We could go and have the conversation on WhatsApp. So the old walls that separated spaces have largely been eroded and disappeared. Um, we get this new notion whereby the infrastructure of an office or a formal social collaborative piece of technology or a laptop given to you by the organization are kind of irrelevant these days compared to 
social collaborative technologies that we own ourselves, like, you know, Facebook or Twitter or private WordPress blogs or, um, you know, Zoom communication like this. They're free, they're open, they're democratized. Um, so who owns the conversation is an important uh, inhibitor or enabler of engagement. And sometimes it's good to be really clear about this. Um, so it might seem like I'm sort of dancing a bit around all these features. And they're peripheral, but I don't, I don't think they are peripheral. Um, in fact, it's not that they don't think it. The evidence shows us they're not peripheral. So in the, in the landscape of trust work, which um, if you haven't um, been following it, is, a, is a, a global research project around trust that I'm running this year. Um, we had 5,000 people take part in the prototype work and um, people said they trust formal technology about 30% less than they trust social technology. So if the organization gives them a piece of technology to collaborate on, they trust it less than technology they own themselves. And if you actually look into that and say, well, what does that mean? How do you trust it less? People say, well, we're less likely to be generous. We're less likely to engage. We're less likely to share because we don't control consequence. The control of consequence is uh, very important. And in fact, if, again, if you're interested in that, and thank you, Sam, for doing such a kind job of chasing down links, there are two articles that relate to that. One is around the sphere of consequence. I, I shared a new piece around that recently. Um, and that looks at how consequence is, um, is applied. That's probably the best, uh, the best piece to look at. Um, but the ownership of conversations is something that we need to address quite directly if we want to encourage co-creation. And then let's just think about reward. I said early on that um, reward isn't specifically financial. People often don't want financial reward. I, I, and I'll give you sort of two bits of evidence around that. Typically in open surveys, if you ask people what they want, reward comes third or sometimes second. In the trust research, where I ask what, um, you know, if your work is valued by the organization, if your input is valued, what type of reward do you want? Um, about 40% of people said they would like financial reward, but 60% said they would like reward in the shape of opportunity, um, about the ability to build legacy was quite important. So effectively, the way I read it is that what people really want is some kind of hard currency of trust, not necessarily of money, which they can take forward. So the, the social contract between organization and individual becomes, if I take part in these co-creative spaces, if I'm engaged within the community, if I help to solve problems, what I want to be building are further opportunities and um, the ability to engage in different spaces. It's uh, really uh, quite fascinating how strongly that, that came through in a number of aspects of the, the trust work. Um, probably one of the key pieces is 54% um, of people, so just you know, over half said, what they really want is freedom to explore. Uh, and when you ask, what do they have? they say they typically have constraint and control. So they experience constraint and control, but what they want is freedom. And again, this speaks to an interesting point. We sometimes feel that we're having to train or educate people in what they need to do. But often what we need to do is get out of their way and let them do the things that they actually really want to do. I was having quite an interesting conversation with the uh, with uh, someone senior in a, a global organization yesterday who was saying, uh, I really wish you could, you could tell me what we need to do in 15 minutes. You know, how, how can we uh, transform our organization? And, and I said to them, you know, really, you kind of could have that conversation because what you need to do to transform your organization is, is transform every aspect of what you do. You know, you have to experiment and explore and be curious and develop a culture in your organization that is open and welcoming of new ideas and has this deeply held ability to be curious. 
But what is our typical experience of organisations, even good organisations, our experience is often one where good ideas lose momentum and energy, are drained of permission, are denied, are deferred, are caught up within the busyness of the everyday. And, and that's a challenge for us. You know, we have to get out of our own way sometimes. So reward is, is a significant thing. We need to consider it, but as well as financial reward, and occasionally financial reward can be relevant. And incidentally, again, if you survey people, what they say is, um, if my input creates value for the organization, so if you're able to make money off the back of my input, I kind of want to see financial reward. But if it's just helping us to be better, then they may want those other types of opportunity. But there are other types of reward. And the most important in terms of social leadership is reputational reward. So if we look back to the, the model itself, the social leadership model, we'll see that, um, in fact, let me uh, just sort of jump ahead slightly. And remember I said in a working out loud session, I reserve the right to jump around a bit. In the, in the model here, um, you'll see in the uh, northeast quadrant reputation and in terms of developing social leadership reputation is the turning point as people build reputation then they will be a awarded social authority so if the reward for co-creation is re a reputational reward then people will be quite likely to um, earn social authority I'll give you a, an example of that, a nice story from, um, from someone last week who, who had had an opportunity um, in quite a large global organisation to take part in a breakfast meeting with the chief executive. So the chief executive was doing a little world tour and was stopping off and having lunch with um, 12 people at a, uh, sorry, breakfast meeting with 12 people at a time. Uh, from across diagonally across the organization to share their ideas and to give them access to someone there and so they'd had a good meeting and it's been very interesting he had shared some views he had listened to some views that was quite nice and she described this story where a couple of weeks later she'd had a, just a nice personal email from that person um, saying i was just reflecting on our sessions and i just wanted to thank you for sharing what you did i think it was quite a brave thing to do so that's you know, is it daft? Is it stupid? Well, you know, of course it is. Maybe they sent the same email to everybody, but it reflected almost that humility of leadership. Um, it, um, it, it reflected their, their, their willingness to engage with it. And that's really what social leadership is about. It's about a humility, a willingness to uh, invest in others. And of course, authenticity is quite important. We did, um, one of the earlier sessions around authenticity. And um, if it subsequently turned out, if she shared that email with somebody else and they said, oh, I got an identical email just with the name change, then suddenly the action would lose its authenticity. So it's an interesting thing with social systems. You can't cheat them. Authenticity is a function of, of, of that kind of genuine imbued power. So um, I quite liked their story. Uh, so let me jump back here we are on reward so yeah we think about different types of reward and reputational reward is, is very significant uh, if you were here on the last webinar you might recognize uh, this uh, slightly oddly drawn fellow um, and, and the reason i put him back in here today is that of course none of us are perfect you know not even all of those amazing enough to be uh, joined together here today um, and, and this really speaks back to the mindset piece if, if we go into a co-creative space believing that we are, you know, A plus, perfect, have all the answers, we're not really engaging in co-creation, we're just broadcasting. But if we go in with a humility to listen to the views of others um, and truly to co-create, then maybe we'll be in a better place and maybe we'll be a little bit further down our journey towards social leadership. So let's just think about a few of the uh, factors around the edges of community now. And um, what I was uh, sort of sketching on here is um, I, I had an earlier, uh, there's an earlier illustration in the book which talks, which asks, where are your libraries? Where are the sources of information that you draw upon? 
Um, we, we've heard a lot recently around echo chambers and fake news and, and such like, and an effect of confirmation bias. And um, confirmation bias is a really fascinating and enjoyable sociological principle of, of how we tend to reinforce what we already know. We, we, we tend to do that. So part of co-creation, both individually and for a community, is to think about, do we have bias? So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, I'm working at the moment in the uh, National Health Service in the UK, uh, our, uh, you know, our, our um, uh, healthcare service, and um, working with communities of practitioners, you can start to ask the question, is everybody in this community a, a nurse or a consultant, or is everybody uh, an accountant? Is there actually bias within our community? How many of the voices that we have around us are voices of agreement? And how many voices are voices of dissent? And I find that's quite a useful barometer. In fact, maybe, maybe I'll draw another illustration for this called the barometer of dissent. You know, you kind of need both. So in a healthy community, you will have difference. If, if I share an idea and you all say, that's a brilliant idea. Well, you know, I might feel better um, because you're confirming what, of course, I already know. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. Um, so if we are trying to build, to curate our, our co-creative communities, we probably want to ensure that we don't have too much, um, uh, too much uh, confirmation bias. We need a broad range of opinions and views. And this, of course, is why social leadership has quite a strong relationship with work around diversity and inclusion, because I would argue, indeed, I think I, I do write it explicitly in the book, if we only hear a subset of voices, and we only hear those voices that agree with us or look like us or think like us, then we're weaker for it. You know, we lack that diversity of, of thinking and approach. So um, this, believe it or not, is supposed to be a battery. It's maybe not a battery that uh, Elon Musk would be proud of to power Australia, but it's, um, it is a, a battery and it's about co-creative power and uh, a sort of encouragement that we spend it wisely. So you remember earlier on, I talked about investing in co-creation. Well, we all invest our time and our effort and our energy and our trust in different ways. But the bottom line is it's not a limitless source of power. Um, communities can't run on empty. We have to nurture and engage them and support them. So um, if we want as individual social leaders to benefit from the co-creative power of our community, we also have to invest and recharge our community. So there may be times when I reach out to you and say, can you help me with something? I've got a problem, something I need to think through, something I need to work on. But if I want that power to be there when I need it, then I also need to invest in you and in the wider community. And that um, comes down to a notion of reciprocity. Um, I, I, I normally say that engagement in, in, social, in a social leadership context is about an engagement without an expectation of reciprocity. So I, I'm not, I engage in the community, but I don't keep a tally. So I don't say, uh, I'm gonna you know, help you, uh, Amy, because I think that you're going to help me uh, next week. I, I engage much as um, I said at the start of the piece, I engage to help you to be successful. And in a belief that by doing so, I'm helping the community to be successful. And if the community is successful and engaged and has high trust, then um, we'll be able to draw upon that power uh, when we need it. And in fact, I was, uh, it's nice to see you here, Amy. It's nice that you've joined us because of course it, it, it speaks to one of the features of, of community, that within a community, there will be some people that we will know a little better, some people that we won't know as well. Um, and hence why we have to be very conscious of those internal dynamics of community to earn our trust through our actions, not to sort of assume it or just to, to liaise with a subset of that community um, uh, rather than the whole thing. So um, one, one, one of the, the pieces I just wanted to consider 
in this context is is the the notion really of noise within community and this speaks to um uh, something that i talk about earlier in social leadership so if you're interested in the notion of sort of signal and noise uh, look back to um the earlier webinar on uh storytelling and on sharing so when we talk about sharing i say that a, a role of social leaders is to add signal not just add more noise because social systems can often be very noisy systems and indeed organizational systems tend to be extremely noisy so a course skill for social leaders is to help to filter um, the signal out from the noise now how do they do that well co-creative communities um, can effectively be that filtering mechanism and why do I say that? Well, kind of because you can throw a lot of stuff into a community, but you'll pre pretty rapidly work out what it is that the community finds valuable. So funnily enough, I was, I was looking um, for a video on, on YouTube uh, night before last because the, the wheel on my luggage broke. And I thought, well, I've got to change the wheel. Uh, how, how do I change it? There was no obvious way to change it. And of course, a quick search gave me a variety of YouTube videos, but I went for the filtered option. So I looked for the one that had the highest number of views and likes on the basis that um, it's been pre-filtered by the community. In that case, not a community I know directly, but that notion of social filtering is quite central to what um, communities can do at scale. So if we think about it like this, why, would you invest in social leadership as an individual or why as an organization would you invest in social leadership well the answer is really because of this filtering capability we need an ability to hear the relevant important signals within a noisy environment and we can either rely on our own brilliance to discover them well you know good luck with that maybe that'll work or we can use this kind of outsourced uh, capability of our community so signal from noise is, is quite an important um, feature i thought i'd just relate um, this piece uh, back into the notion of the socially dynamic organization i think i've mentioned that once or twice and again if you're interested in that uh, you can see on the blog uh, probably two pieces which are uh, relevant one is just an overview of the socially dynamic organization and the other if you look for would be um, sketching on the design principles of the socially dynamic organization and both of those are new pieces of work looking at um, what does all of this mean in the context of organizational design you know what kind of organization do we want and I'm, I'm sharing this because th these notions of agile almost tie in to notions of co-creation so unconformity can be a strength you know because conformity can give us one type of strength but it tends to be quite narrow and brittle. Whilst the diversity of thought and unconformity can give us those stronger social learning communities. So you remember I, I said earlier, engaging in our difference can actually help to make our community stronger. If we just engage in similarity, if we just have a conversation amongst all those people who believe in us and agree with us, then we're kind of making ourselves brittle. We're, we're reinforcing the confirmation um, bias and you'll see here on the left I talk about social filtering and that's that piece about signal from noise so if we have a strong population of social leaders and we have a strong ability to filter the signal from the noise then maybe we can be truly more more agile um, you'll see at the bottom we talk about being deeply fair well this ties into these notions of reward and ownership of the conversation only if the organization is deeply fair can it reap the benefits of co-creation it, it's not going to get it just by giving you an ipad and a piece of technology or by saying you're now part of a co-creative community none of that counts for anything what counts is the other bonds of trust and connection recognition reputation and reward and then let's just sort of think about um uh, a couple of other factors around this um what one is this notion of our, our our shared differences and this is less about um diversity of opinion but more about 
uh, diversity in a global context. So we, we see uh, within today's world that different people around the world are empowered or, or disempowered by cultural factors that dominate. So it would be easy for us to say, um, let's look at the 79 countries in the world where homosexuality is illegal or not yet decriminalized. Now, can people in th that environment be themselves? Can people share freely? Are they inhabiting a world that's free of consequence? Well, probably not. We could look at um, societies where the voice of women is, is, is quieter, is heard less well than the voice of men. Now, it's easy for us to look at different cultures and think that, but I don't know if you've been following the really uh, quite fascinating story about Clark's shoes in the uh, UK that got themselves in hot water um, over the weekend, I think. And they, they did that because this story emerged about their children's shoe range. And um, they, they, they split it. There's a boy's shoe range and a girl's shoe range. The boy's shoes are called leaders. So their lead, their leadership, the range is called leadership. And they're, they're rugged, tough shoes um, made of a heavier leather with better ankle support. The girls' range was called, uh, I believe, uh, Dolly Babe. So it's, it's, it, it's pink and it's covered in hearts. And it's sort of interesting because on the one hand, you could read that and say, well, it's just, it's harmless. It's just because, you know, boys like rugged shoes and girls like to dress up as princesses well you know for sure maybe they do but the point is these are culturally determined norms you, you could take another view of that that says we're from this early age telling boys that they can be leaders and girls that they can be dollies you know what does that mean it's 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 it, it, culture isn't um concrete it's not a fixed force culture is created by our shared acceptance of what it is. So whilst it's easy for us to look globally and say, well, people in that culture are a bit unpleasant because they do this thing, sometimes we have to look at our own culture and say, well, what are we doing? How far are we normalizing and perpetuating um, inequalities? And how does that impact on our ability as a society, as an organization, as a community to truly engage ourselves in the system to be um, co-creative. So um, this, again, you may recognize this if you were on the last webinar around social authority. Um, social authority within that context of social leadership is about um, our, our, our granted permission. So it's about based on our reputation, the authority that community uh, gives us, that our community gives us. So if our social authority is quite low, we're unlikely to be able to engage effectively in co-creation. If our social authority is high, then we're much more likely to be able to, um, to, to, to inspire and engage with a community in order to, to, to co-create. So this is really the payback. If we follow the model of social leadership and we invest in our community and we do so with a humility and a willingness to help others to be successful, the payback is the high social authority that the community gives us and the community's willingness to help us to be successful. So there's a real tangible return for this. Social leadership isn't about being nice. It's not about sort of being kind because it's a soft force. It's about effectiveness. It's about our ability to collectively think our way out of trouble, to innovate. Uh, I'm quite excited tomorrow. I'm kicking off a, a, an innovation program with a, a big uh, telecoms company where we're focused on taking individuals out to experience over 100 different organizations. They get to spend time in all these different organizations to explore what innovation means. But to do that, they have to go into that experience with a humility to accept that their organization doesn't have all the answers. They're going out there to curate new ideas and then they'll come together to co-create what they need to do about it. And that's an approach an organization can take to be more innovative, to change. But you can't do that if you don't have social authority. So 
this piece really is a, is a core, you know, who is left voiceless? Who is left out of these conversations? It's no good for us just to have a small layer of people heavily engaged in co-creation. We need to find ways to engage everybody within our organization. And this speaks to the fluidity of the role of social leadership. And indeed, it looks forward to what we will talk about in the next webinar, which is social capital in social leadership. And social capital is the ability to survive and thrive in these new spaces, and crucially, to help others to survive and thrive. So a socially dynamic organization will have a broad level of engagement across all of the individuals, with nobody being left out because cultural norms or regional norms disempower them and remove their voice. So one role for social leaders is to help people to find their voice. And again, it speaks to this notion that your role as a social leader isn't to come in with all the answers. Your role may be to help other people to find their voice to come in. It may be a nurturing role, a developmental role. It may be a recognition role. It may be a storytelling role. Um, but the roles of social leaders are very fluid. And again, if you're interested in that, if you either go back to the webinar on community or look at the, uh, the blog posts on conditions for community, um, then you'll see some pieces a, a, a around um, that as the role of, of social leaders to help people to find their voice. So I thought just to draw us uh, to a close, I'll, I'll just revisit a couple of pieces. Um, I feel this one's important. It, um, Humility is the foundation of, of social leadership, this notion of action without reward, of respect, of tolerance, of fairness. In the, in the language that I've used in the webinar today, it's about avoiding confirmation bias, about helping people to find their voice, about building high functioning communities. Um, it's this old notion, if we think we have all the answers and we're just looking for a rubber stamp or validation, we're missing the point. Um, the point of social leadership is to hear diverse voices and to be more effective as a result of that. So this is the model that we've been um, working through. This is what sits in the social leadership handbook and, and now in the, the 100 days work. Um, I sometimes like just to, to revisit the structure of it, just to sort of ground um, what we've been talking about today. We start on the left, you know, social leaders choose a space. What will they be known for? Or where will they build their reputation? Social leaders need to be great storytellers and, of course, story listeners. They need to hear the voices of others. They tell stories not just in formal channels, but they also can engage effectively in, in social spaces where their formal power counts for nothing. And they share, as we talked about earlier, to add signal, not just noise. In the second section of the model, we look at community. You know, social leaders will be part of many different communities and they will help those communities to become high functioning. Remember at the start, I talked about high functioning communities, communities that are bonded by trust and respect, communities that seek to transcend confirmation bias by having space for the voices of difference, by being equal and inclusive. Um, by doing this, we earn a reputation. And if we earn a reputation, we may be awarded social authority. And again, I've talked a little about the benefits of social authority. You can't buy it, you can't demand it, you can only earn it. Here, we started talking about co-creation in the final section of the model. The way that communities carry out social filtering functions, help us to separate signal from noise, help us to be more effective. What conditions need to be in place for co-creation to take place? How do we recognize people? How are people incentivized? How are they recognized? How are they rewarded? From here, we'll go on to look at social capital in social leadership, specifically this notion of how, how we survive and thrive in this space and how we help others to do so. And then to look at collaboration as the closing of the circle. You know, how do we collaborate um, widely and effectively? So the next webinar, uh, which is in around a month's time, the, 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 uh, is, uh, there's a full schedule on the, um, on the website. Uh, is going to be looking at that piece around social capital. Um, uh, a couple of things here that the Social Leadership First 100 Days book is um, out now. Feel free to, to order it on Amazon or if you, if you just drop me a note, drop me an email, I'll happily send you a, a copy. Um, it's a guided journey. It's a reflective 100-day journey through social leadership. Um, 
This is something I'm working on at the moment. So this is a side project, a trust sketchbook. Uh, it's a crowdfunded book exploring 12 aspects of trust. So um, I'll probably be putting together a series of webinars around these 12 aspects of trust to run next year. But uh, if you're interested in trust, then stay engaged and be part of the, the landscape of trust research. There are my details to, uh, to stay in touch. Uh, thank you for your time today. This has definitely been the, the most hair-raising webinar for me. I think I walked into this room pretty much on the hour as we started, but all things considered, it seemed to go okay. I think we got away with it. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you everyone for, for joining. We've got, uh, I've got time for questions. Anybody who has questions, please do, uh, do uh, throw them in. Yes, Julian, thank you. That was a really good, um, great event. You did make it just in the nick of time, um, but it wouldn't have shown if we hadn't mentioned it, I don't think. <laughs> so very well done. I've, um, I think you've picked up questions as, um, as you've been going along. There's no um, new ones at the minute, but if anyone does have a question for Julian, do feel free to type it in here. Uh, but of course, if something occurs to you after um, this session finishes in a few minutes, um, as Julian's shared his contact details there, you should be able to find him. I can vouch that he he's, does respond to pretty much everything that you send through. Uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to have the conversation with you. Um, just to confirm, the, the next session is in three weeks' time, September the 5th, and that's 5 p.m. UK time, so the same time as today, uh, and that's on uh, Social Capital, number 10 in the series. Uh, if you do want to revisit any of these sessions, including today's, but please give us a couple of days to upload it, you can visit the YouTube channel of Seasalt Learning, uh, and there's a dedicated playlist there just for the webinars. Uh, no new questions so far, but a few thank yous. Um, Great. Well, that's uh, that's uh, let's wrap up there, and uh, I'll uh, see you all next time. Excellent. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks all. Bye.